is not an engineer, she's not an architect, but she is leading a community towards sustainable living on the water. So without further ado, please welcome from Amsterdam, Marianne de Bloch. Please, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So, I've been at this festival for three days now. I've been here from the very start. And I've been binging all these amazing lectures. And a, a topic that has been referred to quite often is the topic of um, involving citizens in developing their own urban environment. environment. And this is a topic that I would like to contribute to today, speaking from my own experience. So, oh no, I'm too quick, sorry. Um, my name is Marianne. I'm a TV director and editor-in-chief uh, for Dutch television. I live in Amsterdam with my uh, six-year-old twin and my boyfriend in this extremely loving community. Um, this hasn't always been the case. This is where I used to live. A nice street in Amsterdam, a small street in a nice rental apartment, some leakages here and there. It was a bit drafty, but it was fine, absolutely fine. I had a home where I was safe. It was okay. I had my life. I was single. I was 30, living in Amsterdam. What else do you want? But still, there was something that, I don't know, it, it didn't, it wasn't right. I wasn't really unhappy about it. But there were two things that I thought I would love to organize in a different way. Um, first of all, I didn't know my neighbors, none of them. So I was living in this beautiful, I think beautiful, nice little area of Amsterdam, and I didn't know any of my neighbors, and I also didn't know how to, I could get to know them. I just didn't have any clue. Second, I was really interested in living in a more sustainable way. Uh, so I, I, I did the best I could, so I uh, shared my car, I uh, put my trash in the right bins, uh, I had a vegetarian diet. Um, but yeah, it was of course not really fulfilling, so I thought about maybe putting solar panels on my leaking, drafty rental house, but I found out that that's not really the best investment one can do. So I was kind of stuck there, until I got this great assignment as a TV director. Uh, I was asked to do a series on sustainability and housing. And I feel it's a bit, sorry, uh, on sustainability and housing. And therefore, I had to uh, visit this boat, uh, a sustainable houseboat in the north of Amsterdam. And as I was making my film here, I found out about all the sustainability um, installations that the boat had. So it was as sustainable as possible. And it just, during my work, I just felt like, okay, this is the answer. This is, this is what I want. This is so sustainable and living on the water with the, it gave me the sense of complete freedom and, and opportunities. And it was such a strong feeling, really like a small child, like, this is what I want. I was almost lying on the floor, from give it to me. But then, of course, the limiting beliefs came up, like, be real, how can you buy a houseboat? You can't even pay your own rent. You, um, you have a nice house, count your blessings, all stuff like that. Then, luckily, my next thought came, and it was, what if I make this a long-term project? What if I take years to realize this houseboat that I want to live on? Maybe I can get money by then, maybe I can save money or organize stuff. So I didn't let my limiting, be limiting beliefs get in the way of my desire, and I kept on dreaming, and I envisioned this group of friends, let's say 10 to 15 people, together on houseboats like these, living in a community, in, in the city of Amsterdam. There's enough water. And living a more social and more sustainable life than we currently did. So that was the plan. The same evening, I went to one of my best friends, and I started talking to him about this plan. And I was 100% sure he would say, sure, there's Marianne with her thousand plans, thousand plans a day, uh, whatever, this is too big, get real. That was my, I, I was sure he was going to say that. He didn't, he said, wow, what a great idea. 
let's go. We should do this. And I was like, well, okay. So the next days, uh, weeks, I started to talk to, about my plan to more people, to all my friends, actually. And every single one of them said, let's go. This is what I want. Yes to more sustainability. Yes to a more social way of living. Yes to living on the water. So I had a great idea. And of course, I was happy that my idea landed. But it had something tragic about it as well, because I just found out that all of my friends were really longing for a different way of life. Nobody was, yeah, nobody was really happy, actually. That was what I could uh, conclude. So, oh yeah, it even went on. I even got phone calls after a couple of weeks from people that I had never seen that asked me, like, hey, are you Marianne? Are you building this sustainable uh, community? Can I join? So even before we put anything down to paper, people wanted to join, and the plan was born. I knew then that there was no way back. So we decided then, because what do you do as a television maker, a musician, a writer? We were all creatives, not project managers. What do you do first? We had no clue. So we thought, okay, we'll give it a name. Let's give it a name. <laughs> Does anybody know how to pronounce this word? The, the Dutch and the Belgium people from Belgium cannot play this game. <laughs> anybody? No, I understand. Schoonschip. Schoonschip. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful word. It's, it's actually a saying. It's uh, schoonschip maken. Dus to make schoonschip literally means to make clean ship. And it's a Dutch saying, meaning um, to get rid of all the clutter from the past. So everything that doesn't serve you anymore, get rid of it so you can make a new beginning. So I think it was the perfect name for something we had in mind. But we had no idea that we were at like the eve or the beginning of um, creating Europe's most sustainable floating village, where more than 150, sorry, 140 people would live with solar panels and daily tours for people all around the world, and we would be in like every newspaper. We had no clue. I had no clue I would be here talking about it now, 15 years later. But I think that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> because if I would have known then what I would have to go through to get where I am now, I would have never continued. On the other hand, from stand, standing where I'm standing now, looking back, I will do everything all over again, because I, now I know the results. So I guess that's how it works. The, um, the, in it, the, the, the total process, from the idea till the realization, took 12 long years. Uh, this was, of course, very challenging, because uh, we had the group, and we had to keep the group enthusiastic and committed and everything. So we decided to do a lot of workshops with the group. We had the group decide everything. And if I talk about the group, I'm also one of them. So we, had a, we, we choose for a foundation as a legal identity. So we had this uh, board. Um, and I was in the board, but we were also inhabitants. So we did a lot of workshops. So we, we decided all together about the, uh, what, what, about, uh, the, the sustainable materials that we would use, the way our, our village would look like, uh, how we would be organized, everything. We did everything with the group through workshops. And I think that um, the reason that we managed to keep a really consistent group for 12 years was that we had these three pillars. We promised ourselves Schoonschip is social. So Schoonschip is um, not a project for the people, but a project from the people. Schoonschip is sustainable. So we, every decision we had to make, it was easy because we always try to choose for the most uh, sustainable option. And it had to be feasible. So it had to be uh, affordable for, for more incomes, different incomes. Um, and then we had our famous tagline that we always kept in our minds, Schoonschip is the most sustainable floating neighborhood of Europe. Um, so we had this really high ambition, and I think because of this, those high ambitions, we just kept on going in the same direction. Um, next challenge, of course, a location. We've been all around Amsterdam, 
Uh, we've been lobbying at several um, uh, districts with local authorities, but most people weren't really waiting for a musician, a filmmaker, and a TV director to start a floating village in their district. I understand. We ended up in the north of Amsterdam. It's the area you see here, so you see a lot of industry, hardly any people living there. It's different nowadays. And we found this spot in the canal, and we started to talk to the local authorities over there. They told us, come back in 15 years. We are now developing the land. The water will come later. But at the same time, there was this um, person, this polit polit uh, politician, uh, he was um, uh, responsible for sustainability and social planning. And he had this, this message to Amsterdam that we should be more like Berlin. So let's have more um, uh, citizen initiatives. That was his goal. So we went to him and we said, yeah, you have this goal, we have this plan, uh, what do we do? And then he went to the local authorities that were responsible for the north of Amsterdam, told them to be open to our project. So they opened up, they, we, we, we talked to them, they liked our project, but then, of course, they couldn't just say, here's a piece of water, go ahead. That's not how it works, because we have all these thousand rules uh, to stick to. So um, we uh, were asked to be participant in a tender that they announced. So they, uh, what, what happened was there, the tender that was announced was based on our idea, so a floating sustainable village made, from the, made with people uh, from bottom up. And this was, of course, a nerve-wracking time because it could have happened that we would have paved. Yeah, we would, somebody would go, uh, go away with our piece of water, you know, and then we would have done the work but not get the, the land. Uh, there was another, um, I just uh, tender, and there was another, sorry, I mean this one, another challenge, and that was that the tender didn't quite, um, the demands of the tender didn't quite meet the needs and the ambitions of our group. So in the tender, there, there was this demand that we would uh, develop the piece of water with only 30 households meaning every household would get a house of two to 300 square meters. That was not what we wanted. We didn't think that was sustainable. So we uh, decide, decided to issue a, um, a document with two plans. The first one was completely following the demands of the local authorities. We called it Plan A Social, meaning anti-social in Dutch. And the second was Plan B Social. And in this Plan B Social, we opted for 46 households. We won. It was a big risk, because you have to stick to the demands of the local authorities, but we didn't, and we won. So that was great. Um, so we won the tender. That was, of course, a big boost for our project, but the most work still had to be done. And uh, don't forget that we were working already for five years. So after winning the tender, the design phase could start. Um, we had already done a lot of work on our urban planning, so on the, on the jetties that we wanted to construct, that we had to do that in order to win the tender. But now the designing with, uh, with, um, uh, with the inhabitants could start. So we wanted, of course, to have everybody as much say in their, uh, in their own house, in their own project. So we had everybody choose their own architect. This was a really ambitious choice because it took a lot of extra communication and work, but the results were there. Uh, and in order to have some organization, we did make guidelines for the designs. We called them passports. And in every passport, you could see like the restrictions, so the how the boats had to be positioned, how high the boats could be, uh, square meters. Did your boat have to have a slow proof or straight? Uh, straight? Well, you know what I mean? So things like that. And then after the designing, we made this uh, skill model so we could see with the group if everything was still OK, if it, I was not in looking from my uh, window, bathroom in other, somebody else's bathroom, or I, I wasn't taking too much sunlight for my neighbor or whatever. So we were able to adjust after looking at the skill model together. Um, after the design, there was the construction phase. The, the uh, concrete boxes were, were made on land. Uh, 
And then afterwards, we worked with um, wooden frame constructions that were put on the um, concrete boxes. It was really nice. You know, it was really uh, amazing to see everything come, come, uh, become reality. You see people here um, building with hay, somebody kissing his, her uh, concrete box. Thomas, being my, uh, my best friend, being his own uh, construction supervisor. It was an amazing time. Uh, yeah, this is what it looked like. Looked like. So you see all these weird designs that people made up. And then, oh yeah, in the meantime, we were working on the jetty. So the jetty was being built in the canal. And you see here uh, uh, five uh, contact points with land. But after we put the boats all in, the, this part, I will point it, like the, the part on the water, are all also connected with floating jetties. So it's really like one, like a circle almost. I hope I explain it well. So then, in the meantime, the house was, houses were ready, but they were on land, and it, they needed to be in the water. So what did we do? There was this big crane picking up our house and putting it into the water. This was the most terrible day of my life, because you see, like, 12 years <laughs> of hard work floating in the air. Not only 12 years of hard work, but all your money and, and, and uh, your home, your future. And then still not knowing for sure if it also will float. So that was quite exciting. And if it does float... Oh, I think it's double. Okay. What if it does float? Then it has to go from uh, the, the, the construction area to the community area. And that looks like this. Wow. This is an I, the typical... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. This is not my house, but it's my neighbor's. I'm looking at that house now. It's crazy, right? <laughs> And we had to do this, of course, with more boats. I'm not going to play it completely, because it, it will take too long. But just to give you an idea of how we organized everything with the jetties. So the open spaces to be able to put the boats uh, on their spot. And then afterwards, uh, closing the jetties, so it becomes a complete village. Yeah, I can look at this like forever. Um, what did we create? We are there now with 87 adults, 55 kids. One of them is two days old. Sorry. Okay, so 87 kids, 55 adults. So that those are uh, 46 households living on 30 floating houses. So if you walk around, you will see 30 objects. But half of them are... Um, inhabited by two households, like this one is two households, this one the same, two households. Uh, ecological sustainability, it feels kind of weird to go through this like really quick, but today I really wanted to focus on the group and the power of community, but I can of course talk the whole day about what we achieved on the ecological sustainability level. We are really a big player in the, in the transition to a more sustainable world. We have uh, built all, uh, the, all our boats with as the... Sorry, I'm going to be too enthusiastic. Relax. We built our houses with uh, the most sustainable materials as possible, wherever possible. We don't use gas. We uh, generate our own electricity and uh, use it as much as possible. We have only one connection to the main grid. We use... Um, 30 heat pumps, and we, all the houses have batteries, and all the houses are connected to a smart grid, so we can exchange, exchange electricity in between the different households. Like I said, we have only one connection to the main grid, and we are able to really monitor, monitor our, our use and how we can do it better. So that's really amazing. And we have vacuum toilets, like the, the toilets you have in the plane, and then they separate our gray and black water. The black water goes to this biorefinery to um, turn it into bioenergy. And we heard 
after saying yes to the location, we heard that we uh, were not allowed to, to have cars, or we, we were allowed to have cars, but we wouldn't get a parking permit, which was for some people of our group a big problem. So uh, we started this uh, pilot project of electrical car sharing, and uh, now the whole neighborhood is, uh, is also connected to this project. So it's, I just like to share this because we had so many difficulties, and this is really an example of how we made a really nice solution for, uh, for a difficulty. So if you hear no, we, we didn't accept the no, so we just kept on developing, and I'm, I'm really proud of this, uh, this extra pilot. Then there is, of course, the social sustainability, which is for me the most important. We have been living here now, of there, for uh, four years, and um, the first traditions have already are already a fact, like the New Year's Eve, New Year's, sorry, the New Year's plunge. So on the 1st of January, everybody jumps into the water. It's minus one degrees here. And I'm standing on the jetty, of course, taking the pictures. <laughs> and the other really nice tradition we have is the, is the, the, diner, uh, the diner soiree, we call it. The whole group turns into this big Italian family, and we make nice white tables on the jetty, and we eat uh, pasta, and we drink wine, and it's really nice. We enjoy each other's uh, company. So I think that we are this... Um, that we managed to, to build such a nice community because we, we found a way to really respect each other, so we respect each other's privacy, but we do stimulate each other in, in living in a more sustainable way, but nobody's judging. There is no judgment, There's no, there are no dogmas. We don't think in, in black and white, and if people decide not to do anything for the community for some time, that's also fine. Some people work always, and some people hardly do anything, it's like that in the world. So we really try to let everybody be who they want to be. And I think also the fact that we realized this um, yeah, piece of city together made it almost like, like a holy place. So we really take care of it together. We take care of each other. We want to keep it sane, and we want to keep it real. So I, I really feel that we are the owners of this Piece. And it's, it's not on only this piece of land, a piece of water in our case. We also connect to the neighborhood. We build a park on, the, on land for the whole neighborhood. We try to, to put as much green things and plants in the water so all sorts of birds are attracted. Um, and I think the, the fact that we build it all ourselves makes it so, uh, so special for us and keeps the community together. And I've, I know, of course, that this, this is not possible for just everyone. And it, this was not, not my initial idea. When I had the idea, I, I truly couldn't get any mortgage. I had no clue. But we just started, and because of the rules of the local authorities, the sustainability ambitions of, 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 of the city, we were um, like asked yeah, well, to grow, and this is what came out of it. And I just hope that people don't find it too intimidating, because sometimes you hear these stories like, oh, it's only for the rich people. We want to transform, help to transform that, so we really want to try to be a pioneer to make things more common, and therefore we, we also uh, put all our uh, lessons online, everything that we learned, not our lessons, our learnings, on our uh, green print, so we are completely open source. And I would like to end with this quote from um, Marike van Doornik. She was the politician, she was our person to go to in, uh, uh, at the local authorities. And she was amazing, but she was also really, truly honest. And this is what she said at our big opening. I think we can say that Schoonschip has succeeded, not thanks to, but despite of the municipality. And I think it's really brave of her that she said that. And I think she's right. And I hope that in the future we will find a way for municipalities and citizens to work more together instead of more like against each other. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank one you. of my favorite, I would say. Really? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mo very, very often, you know, we were asked about how utopian things can become reality. This is one of those. I mean, you know, living on, on the water, bringing together a community. Uh, so we're very happy, not just that this is like a, a living dream, but it's also been explained uh, thoroughly, you know, how to make it work. So um, this is exactly what we're also trying to have from our speakers. Of course, there's theories, there's uh, intentions, there's values, there's conversation, there's many things, but then also, uh, you know, we need to make them concrete. So today, we're going to have uh, uh, at least three, four examples of that, you know, how to come from utopian to very practical. And they, they are an example of uh, asking more from our cities, no? We have to ask more. And uh, do you have any question, maybe from the crowd? Yes, we have one of ah, our, from, from one our question editor. From, my, from a guy that I don't know. Can we have a microphone <laughs> in the first row? Uh, yeah, Madeleine, here. here in the center, thank you. Daniele, please. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, are you planning to replicate uh, somewhere else, or maybe in other cities, the project? Or, I mean, it's just something that can happen in that place with that vision and with those people? He wanted it in Turin, I'm sure. To <laughs> yeah. live in. No, not in Please. Turin. <laughs> I was looking at the river, but it has this current, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to do that, but uh, I actually I don't want to do it myself, but I would love to help people who want to do it. And maybe you cannot copy the, the project for 100%, but I'm sure you can copy elements of it mm. and adjust it to the, the location that you, that you want to build it. But of course, like, I, in my opinion, this project has only succeeded when there are more projects like this, that you can build for less money, build quicker, and we, we did all the work, and now it needs to be copied, and then, then we su succeeded. Yeah. But I don't, I'm not working on a project in, uh, anywhere, no. You are living now in your house, yes. happy. happy. Yeah. I'm, ha I'm <laughs> yes. happy of that because another obsession of you know, the, the, the times we're living in is the, is the scaling up word, which I hate, you know, because yeah. You know, we don't have to scale everything. <laughs> no, we it's can true, but you can pick parts something. of it. Yeah. 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 And um, can you please uh, suggest yes. to, to us, our audience, and also our guest, uh, what is your favorite keyword to contribute to the manifesto yeah. for a new city making? I was wondering if there's, I heard these words like place making and place taking, and I was wondering if there's a word like place giver or place provider? Yeah. Okay. Is it already there? No. Place There's not giver. a word like that. Place giver. Yeah. It's a bit weird. Maybe I like for it. place provider, maybe. Okay. Yeah. People who, who have a say and they can help citizens to give them space. Space. Yeah. So they be can become a space maker. I like okay. it a lot. We, we yeah. need more of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give it to him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.